everybody. Welcome to Wrestling of Statistics, the only show that looks at the world of professional wrestling through the lens of stats, analytics, and everything in between. I am your host, as always, Ryan Knightsey. Uh Craig Leesk is not here. Craig Leesk of Pro Wrestling Music is not here. Gotta, gotta get that plug in. Craig is not here this week. Uh, he is currently on vacation uh which good on you craig go on that vacation please uh i'm sure it's like many people i I, many people would love to on vacation right now uh especially with the pandemic and whatnot and all the stress that brings so good on craig for getting a vacation just hope he's uh staying safe you know staying separated from others or people you know just enjoying himself on this time away uh, so he is not here this week, but to to not just be by myself, I have brought in help from another show, another podcast, another guest uh, from our sister brother show. I don't know what the difference between calling things a sister show or a brother show, but from our other show, at the very least, hit the books, which you can listen to every single Friday on this same exact podcast feed or YouTube channel, whatever you're generating this media uh, we have with us today, with me today, Mikey Man Freddy. Mikey, how are you doing? Welcome to Wrestling with Statistics. Hi. Uh, this is not the show I'm usually on. <laughs> I feel like I've been transported. Yes, we we a portal opened up, and you fell through it, uh, and you've arrived on a on a Monday instead of a Friday. Yeah, I, I'm used to I'm used to being on the weekend. I'm I'm more of a weekend guy. I'm like. <laughs> I'm like Garfield. I hate Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> and your thoughts on lasagna? Just got to ask. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. Lasagna is fine. I thought lasagna is pretty great. What are you talking about? I'm like Garfield in the sense that I hate Mondays, but like uh, lasagna is fine. This is this is just annoying me. You with your Italian heritage. This is just your lack of lasagna love. is just annoying me, Mikey. <laughs> I don't need to like every type of pasta just because I'm Italian. I also hate the fact that not only did we bring you in from Hit the Books, we also brought our food talk in from Hit the Books. We're a food <laughs> podcast now, baby. Yeah, Hit the Books, uh, which you can listen to every Friday, like I said. Um, it's also apparently a food podcast it's for some Wrestling reason. Wrestling with deliciousness. What's up? It's a food podcast now. Well, Mikey, since you're from Hit the Books, and obviously I'm also there, but I would love for you, what... So what is hit the books? What is what is if people are listening to this and they're interested in like, oh, what what is that? What am I listening to? What is, what is hit the books that comes out every Friday? Hit the books that comes out every Friday is the one and only rest, uh, Smackdown versus Raw booking podcast in the universe where I am taking over Friday nights on Smackdown and making my own show over there. And Ryan is taking over Raw on Monday nights. Ryan, Monday is just your night, huh? Yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah, so we we book our own cards for SmackDown and Raw. I book SmackDown, Ryan books Raw, and then we come together on pay-per-views. We do it every week, uh, and it's great. You should go listen to it every Friday. Yeah, go go check that out, definitely. It is a hoot, and also a food food podcast. We and say. also partly a food podcast. For some reason, mainly because we record right before lunch every single week, and we're like, man, we need to stop doing this. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yeah, it's a great show. Definitely go check it out uh mikey thoughts on i i want to we don't talk about it much on hit the book so i want to hit you just introduce you to our to the wrestling of statistic folks but when was i asked this last week as well for our past guest utt rob uh when was the first moment in wrestling that made you realize you love it when it's not necessarily the first match you saw you know not necessarily like the first pay-per-view or whatever just sort of like that first sort of moment that you were like oh yeah this is the thing that i enjoy this is what i want to watch i used my uncle used to be a big wrestling fan um he used to go like like when he was a kid he went to wrestlemania he went to like a bunch of because my uncle had like some connections so you'd always get tickets my other uncle had connections would always get tickets for them to go so so you had one always, you had one uncle that liked res, that liked wrestling and the other re, re, uncle had connections well it was it was one uncle had connections so we got the other one tickets which got that one into wrestling it's like a you know oh i see I he would like get him tickets to events and be like you want to come and he'd be like yeah i guess and then he would watch it and he loved it okay okay yeah so then uh he introduced it to me when we used to watch uh some matches when i don't even i think it was 
Raw? Like, it was a long, long time ago. Like, this was when I was, like, five years old, maybe. So this is, like, almost 20 years ago at this point. Um, so we're talking, like, and, Triple H. We're talking Rock Stone Cold at the time, right? Yeah. Uh, but our favorite was Kane. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, man. For me, it was, like, him doing the fire thing and the choke slam was, like, for me, it was, like, the coolest finisher out of all of them. And, like, that's what first got me into wrestling when my uncle used to show me Kane matches and I would and I would watch Kane come in, do the fire and just like it mesmerized me. I was like in on there. He got me uh, WrestleMania 2000 for the N64 and I was literally Kane every match I played, <laughs> no matter what. Um, and it was my favorite. That's how that's what got me into it. Like I got into it as a kid when my uncle used to show me Kane matches and it was my favorite thing in the world. That's awesome. That's awesome. I don't think I ever asked you that question before. I love that answer. <laughs> I used to do. Yeah, he, he got me so into it that when I was a kid, I had this like big like Charmander stuffed animal that was like maybe like this, like a little a little smaller than I was. And I used to wrestle with it on the trampoline <laughs> or like on, on like on like the couch or something. I mean, who didn't? I, I did distinctly remember in my bedroom, we had some sort of like large, you know, larger than life stuffed animal or whatever. And doing mm-hmm. like I remember doing like suplexes off my bed frame onto my bed. I remember like doing uh I feel like I did like flips off my bed somehow. I don't know. I feel like my one of my favorite moves to do was a swanton bomb because it was literally just a flip. Oh, I used to do that on a trampoline all the time. Uh, it's so easy. But I remember on, on, on a trampoline I also was able to do um a whisper in the wind, which was my favorite thing to do. That's awesome. I <laughs> that's so cool. I, I remember doing like I remember like one of the finisher moves I had in my head, because it was like Evan Bourne was doing it at the time, and it was that uh a meteora off like the top rope and he would do mm-hmm. it like wh- you know while someone's facing the facing him on the top rope he would do a knees to the face going down mm-hmm. sasha banks did the same move i remember my move was just have the, the person's like turned around so it's like the knees to the back of the head driving their face down Ooh, like a meteora face buster kind of thing yeah. i like it i i don't i've never seen a single wrestler do that in my years of watching wrestling the coolest meteora I've seen is uh, probably Mike Bailey's the the shooting star meteora. Sick. Oh, I gotta I gotta, I gotta read. I gotta watch more. Mike I, Bailey I'm pretty sure Mike Bailey does it. He I think I think his finisher. I don't I forgot what it's like called like like actually, but it's it's like a shooting star press meteora. I got it. That, that's gonna be my next question. Is um, you uh, in the past year you've been really trying to delve out into independent wrestling um you know whether it you know so going leaving the the nest of wwe and going into the waters of beyond wrestling and um nope that's canceled <laughs> trying to think of trying to think of other independent wrestling promotions so i was like nope that one's canceled uh <laughs> into indirect independent wrestling promotions this will stop there who yeah. uh in, in this new like rise of independent wrestling who has been a who's been some standouts for you for me definitely like i like i said mike bailey for sure um i really like this is this is before he got kind of like i i started getting into orange cassidy before he was like signed with aew Mm -hmm. um not that i mean i didn't mean that to sound so hipster (laughs) like uh, i was into him before he was cool (laughs) um People like people like Kylie Ray, people like Warhorse, people like uh, Jordan Grace, Ethan Page, uh, Sh- big, Dunk- big impact Sh- guy Sh- over here, Sugar Dunkerton, uh, Gen- Gentleman Jervis, like Martin Kirby, wrestlers like that were my favorites to watch for sure. Nice, nice. I, I that's good. That's good. I think that's a good way transition into our first match discussion or match breakdown of. Uh, the opening match, which I thought was amazing. I thought this was such a great match. It was Cody Rhodes again defending that TNT championship, this time against independent wrestling legend uh, Eddie Kingston. Uh, Eddie Kingston, of course, coming out before the match, just cutting the most brutal promo I've, I've ever seen and heading into uh, a no disqualification match against Cody Rhodes. Before we break down the numbers, Mikey, what were your thoughts on the match in general? Oh, I liked it. I like I liked it a lot. Uh, Kingston put on a good show. Uh, so did so did Rhodes. It was just an awesome match, all t- like all around. He cut a great promo in the beginning that really got me right in. Like he hooked me immediately. Like I've never watched Eddie Kingston before this. Um, 
which is wild considering how many independent wrestling matches I've watched. <laughs> um, but I was really into him. I was really into his like vibe. Uh, and he hooked me right away. And I loved the match. I liked the match a lot. I didn't like I wasn't like crazy into it, but like I liked it a lot. It was good. I remember seeing someone tweeted out that like it. there's not many people that can sell you into a building just on spoken word alone. Eddie Kingston is one of those people. Mm-hmm. And I, that really helped him cutting that promo beforehand really helped my enjoyment going into this match. Uh, but looking at the numbers here, uh, I'm going to do hopefully I'm going to do Craig justice because Craig's usually the one that breaks this down like this. But uh, looking at the numbers right here and it's on your screen, if you're listening to it on YouTube at hit the books podcast on our YouTube account, uh, looking at the numbers here, Eddie Kingston outdoes Cody Rhodes in strikes by 52 to 38. Very, very close. Strike downs also close, but Eddie well, Kingston. 52 to 48. Yes, yes. Uh, strike downs as well, three to two. Grapples, four to one. Um, also outdoes him in submission seconds, along with obviously fouls slash weapon use. Fouls being uh, any sort of thing that uh, the referee doesn't sort of like uh, when it comes to a no disqualification match, more so than anything else that comes to chair, uh, concrete, let's say it's, tax. It's um, kind of cr- it's kind of crazy that if you look at the if you look at the offense type and performance chart, it looks like Eddie Kingston kind of outdid Cody in basically everything. Yeah. Yeah. He just running down that list. Like he outdoes him in anything. The only sort of numbers or only sort of category that Cody Rhodes gets the edge on is in reversals. And even then it's 13 to 10. We're looking at match offense. Eddie Kingston dominated the match offense of 54% over Cody Rhodes, 46 strike down rate, uh, which of course Mikey strike downs are, uh, you know, strikes are just punching a dude, but striking down is you're punching them so hard that they fall to the ground. Uh, so that means of Eddie Kingston's 52 strikes, 6% of them were knocking Cody down versus Cody's 4% strike down rate. And like I said, mm-hmm. Cody's reversal rate, a little bit higher than Eddie Kingston. Uh, and for a match that lasts only 11 minutes, I don't think it was a commercial break once. Looking at the flow of offense here, like we said, Eddie Kingston sort of dominating the match pretty much for a full... 12 13 minutes until cody rhodes is able to get that uh that edge at the very last couple of minutes there he was he was he was dominating for a full 12 13 minutes in the 11 and a half minute match uh (laughs) this is why craig does this uh yeah no i just realized that his bar here goes from five to ten minutes to ten minutes plus (laughs) so let's say it's like six minutes maybe is when cody six seven minutes is when cody just starts you know eking out the victory there and looking again at the flow of offense in terms of tie changes, Eddie Kingston pretty much staying on top of Cody, pretty much staying on top. Cody gets that huge jump at about 18 offensive value, uh, maybe about four, three was minutes. That when, was that the, the I think I feel like that was the moment where he did the backdrop onto the concrete, maybe that would be my guess. I would ha- I did not, you know, Craig usually has this written down on his sheet, but obviously he's not here. But I want to say that is the case. I want to say it was when he did that back body drop onto the concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, I'm because I, he did a couple moves as well. Because basically, so that, that was the first time I definitely remember Cody getting the edge in that match. Yeah. But of course, Eddie Kingston just gets the edge immediately back, back to those heights. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, just sort of stays con- consistent uh, up until the very end. And again, you can sort of see the faint, a very faint line here. That's sort of like R squared line that you can sort of see very similar to the last line where Eddie Kingston's on top. And then all of a sudden Cody is able to get the comeback at the very last second. With uh, D figure four. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, to me, the big story of the match here is that, uh, you know, you're looking at this and, you know, the big dominating number here is strikes. Mm-hmm. You, know, you could say reversals, but also submissions. I think that's the basic story of the match that I saw here was that this match is more of a fight than anything. (laughs) Say it again. They hit each other lots. Yeah. I was about to say is like they, this match has sort of become a fight rather than a match itself. What were based Mm -hmm. on these, these numbers here, Mikey, what's your sort of takeaway? My takeaway from this is that, like you said, this was more of a fight than it was a real, than it was a wrestling match. Eddie Kingston made it a brawl and, uh, you could like you said, the numbers show that with the, the amount of strikes and the amount of uh, submission seconds that Kingston has, he he wanted to wear Cody down and finish him off with. He, he looked like he wanted to finish his match off with a knockout the way he was hitting Cody. So uh, yeah, that was really interesting. 
Yeah, he wanted, and with the the tack usage and fouls in general, it's like not just knock him out, but just like tear him asunder. <laughs> like yeah, just like completely destroy him. Yeah, and obviously Cody doing the best in his ability. You know, he's very close of strikes. You know, very close of a lot of things, and trying to rever- that reversals, trying to reverse as much as possible. Cody's doing the best he can in this match to stay in it, um, mm-hmm. and then eventually getting the win. What what are your thoughts? Why do you think Cody was able to get the victory? You know, obviously he is not expecting Eddie Kingston to come out this week. Um, and obviously those tax aren't helping his back that much. Uh, what do you think it was about Cody's offense or motivation or what have you that ultimately led to a victory? Well, throughout the match, uh, I, I think he was he was kind of focusing on Kingston's leg. Because I remember there was a point where Kingston kind of tweaked his knee a little bit. Mm hmm. Um, and Cody started focusing on that. And then that's when he locked in that figure four to get the pressure on the legs. And that's what ended up getting the victory. I think the, I think the victory came all around when, because Cody was focusing on one area of the body and, and he finished with that rather than Eddie Kingston, who was just trying to all around just annihilate Cody in every way, shape and form. That's a great point. Like, I think Cody was just a little more focused on, on getting the victory here. That's a great point. It's almost like, like Eddie Kingston almost wanted to fight while and and obviously get Cody to fight him, but Cody stayed, you know, held his composure and stayed ultimately a wrestler where he was like able to, you know, instead of just like punching or hitting him wherever Cody was able to just focus his attack on that hurt knee and led to victory. Indeed. Yeah. He, you know, and I, and I think that's a, that's a very, very great point, Mikey. Like he, Cody and then this is Cody and Moxley weirdly enough have been like the constant thread on our show of like they've always been this sort of all around wrestler it's weird mm-hmm. to think Moxley's in that that group as well uh, but they're very similar that you know we've done these match you know breakdowns and whatnot Cody and Moxley are weirdly similar um, but yeah like Cody being somebody that is focusing a, on a lot I mean the reversals I think were probably key here for him as well to help re- retain that. Uh, mm-hmm. lead. I mean, he only, he does only have the slight edge there, but I think that slight edge did end up being a huge factor. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, the, these numbers can't quite, Oh, uh, that would have been actually great. Craig did recently. He did. And he was just testing it out because it takes a lot more work. He's also on vacation. And he did these numbers. and I don't want to ask too much of him right now. But recently he did, uh, like, he was tracking body part hits. Like, you know, in, like, the SmackDown vs. Raw video games where it's, like, yeah, you know, yeah. limb targeting? Track of how, yeah, how, how red the limbs are. He he, he did that uh, with a, the EO, I think it was the Io Shirai Sasha, ba- or maybe the Tegan Knox match. I don't remember which match it was. But he did with one of those matches. This would have been a great match to see that now that I think about it. To see how 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 hard Cody really attacked that leg. Yeah, and and conversely, I wonder how much Eddie because our theory currently, I guess, is that how much Eddie Kingston's spread of offense was versus, mm-hmm. like you said, Cody's attack being solely on Kingston's knee. Um. Yeah, I wonder. Now that now that I think about that, the more I think about that, it's like I really. Man, do I bother? I'm just gonna message Craig all, right now and be like, "Hey, Craig, do get off the beach or wherever you're at. Get off of this. Get out go of make the a grass. Go. Yeah, get out of get out of the Scotland Scotland beaches, <laughs> the famous Scotland beaches. Um, but yeah, I, I is there any more to say really about this numbers? I mean, Eddie Kingston was dominant the entire time, but he just succumbed to wrestling. Is that fair to say? I guess so. Yeah, like he. He kind of got, uh, he kind of did it like it. It wasn't the it wasn't the match he ended up wanting. You know, he wanted the he wanted the fight. He wanted the brawl. He wanted the hardcore match. Cody gave him a technical wrestling match and uh, just how technical. I mean, he got the reversals in and he worked the knee enough to finish him off with a figure four. Yeah, that's a great point. It, It he it wasn't the fight that he wanted. Mm-hmm. very interesting i mean i guess the ultimate question is eddie kingston uh you know he's you know the first guy that has wrestled cody since the tnt tournament started that was unsigned you know unlike ricky starks ricky starks 
I believe was signed. I mean, the the rumor was that he came out of the back and Co- Tony Khan immediately signed him. I mean, to my knowledge, I haven't heard anything like that with Eddie Kingston. Um, mm-hmm. Do you what what would you like to see Eddie Kingston more in AEW? I would. I think they need more guys like Eddie Kingston. I think they need they need more guys like that with the that hardcore edge, you know. He he's a better Luther. <laughs> that's what I've heard. Yeah, that's what people have been saying. Uh, oh really? People? Have, oh dang it! I thought I had the I thought I had the great take. I, there. I heard. I, I saw a couple of comments. That's like what like Kingston is doing. What Luther? Like he's he should he should be where Luther is. Yeah, or maybe not where Luther is, but like what Luther is, <laughs> because yeah. Luther is pretty much at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Yeah, he like he should be doing what Luther is doing, you know. Yeah, like Kingston, you know, same you know vet of experience like Luther has. I think Luther might be a little bit older than Kingston. Uh, I gotta look that up. Um, Luther is fifty one. I do not think Eddie Kingston is fifty one. From, from what I saw, I think Eddie Kingston Eddie, fits can, and can slot perfectly into the AEW roster. You know, Eddie Kingston thirty eight old for a wrestler but not old like luther um yeah i think he'd be perfect you know he there is that like slight hardcore quality with aew i think eddie kingston isn't necessarily i would say hard a hardcore kind of wrestler but he's definitely like a fighter uh Mm -hmm. and you got a guy that can cut a solid promo. He doesn't need anybody else. He doesn't need a manager. He's he's a solid package to begin with. Maybe a little rough around the edges, but you maybe have some rough around the edges for a TNT and live <laughs> network television saying that he's going to bury Cody and he's going to smile about it. Maybe, you know, maybe. The- I mean, that was is that I mean, that was like his fr- was that his first television appearance? I, would, I could imagine. He, to my knowledge, yes. Like he, it, it, it's a, something at I least in America, you know? at least in America. I feel like I feel like all the a lot of the people from like a- AEW kind of had that, you know. Oh, that's fair. I guess that's a fair point. At, like when they first started, because they weren't used to the TV style. Like obviously Cody knew it. Obviously, like Cody knew it, and like some of the bigger guys knew it. But like, there's there's some there's definitely some some uh, a learning curve there, you know. Yeah, I believe. The only other thing I can think of is that Eddie Kingston was it wasn't on TV, but potentially I'm going to look it up would have been probably evolve 100. I'm going to guess. No, not one it would be 150, maybe 150. <laughs> it was I believe I believe the only thing I can think of that he was like on big time. He was on NWA for a little bit, which is just on YouTube. But I believe he might have been on the Evolve Wrestling show that was on the WWE Network. Mm-hmm. Evolve 131. Apparently. Was he in this match? Was he on the show? Yes, he was on the show. He's in a tag team match where he lost the tag team championships. Oh, no. Uh, uh, yeah, Eddie Kingston was on <laughs> WWE Network already. Hmm. It's weird to think about. Uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, he doesn't have a lot of like national TV experience, but he's been in the game for like 13 plus years or whatever. Um, I, I say sign him, you know, I say you, I, I mean, I don't know if you, I don't know if Chris Jericho's gonna be happy about it, but maybe a cut Luther and <laughs> pick up Eddie Kingston instead. I mean, yeah, why not? Like, I, I feel like there's no reason not to, you know? Yeah, I get you. Uh, well, then let's move on to the next part of the show. Uh, we're only doing one match uh, breakdown this week. We're recording on the Thursday. Usually record these on Sundays. We're recording early. Just make sure we get this out. So we're missing. The, I know there's, uh, when, by the time you're listening to this, there was New Japan shows that happened that potentially were very interesting. And potentially there's a huge elephant in the room uh, that we're not discussing if, in fact, Hiromu Takahashi, a junior heavyweight, defeats Evil to become the IWGP heavyweight and intercontinental champion. That could be a potential uh, elephant in the room that we're just not discussing, Mikey. Uh, but if yes. It, but if it, uh, do, if it did, yeah, if it did happen, then awesome. If it didn't, then who? Then what? The great match. It was a great match, I guess. But we're moving on to the next segment, which uh, we've been doing the past several shows since almost the beginning of this this podcast. We've been looking at the relationship and different 
stat and stat categories. You know, we're looking at strikes, strike downs, grapples, etc., uh, and comparing them to the win loss records of certain wrestlers in AEW to see if there's some sort of relationship between the two. We sort of figure out that, you know, strikes lead to victories, but even more important than that, strike downs lead to victories. You know, if you can, you know, punch your opponent so hard that they, you know, you knock them down, more than likely you'll you'll get the win. So what we talked about last week is that there are some instances where it might appear that, you know, last week we talked about taunts and whether or not that leads to victory. That more like to appear that the taunts didn't lead to victories, but rather the victories led to confidence, which led to taunting. So we sort of wanted to take a, the, another abstract approach to the win-loss record as well. And this week we're talking about the foul rate. So like I said at the top of the show, fouls, anything referees do, don't like, hair pulling, eye gouging, chair shots what have you things mm-hmm. that the referee that is illegal technically so we got the graph here uh mikey talking about the, the relationship between fouls and win loss record and just like last week slightly slightly positive not like fully you know not like a runaway you know correlation here but there is like a very very not you know minimal positive correlation where it does a non-zero amount a non- sure. <laughs> yes it's definitely not at the very least not a negative amount which we have had before but mm-hmm. at the very least a, a minimal minimum positive correlation where it does seem to show that fouls uh fouling a lot can win uh can lead to victories uh mikey thoughts on that whoa so the so cheaters do win sometimes <laughs> cheaters cheating does prosper apparently unbelievable i've been lied to my whole life (laughs) (laughs) well what do you what do you think what do you what do you think about this grouping right here this graph right here uh what what i mean any sort of big takeaways that you can sort of pick up on um for me i think it's like the standouts are like right like where art like right around the arch like archer is archer and mjf i think that is uh but like those those three dots are pretty big outliers for me yeah archer mjf having uh, um not really middle of the pack but definitely i would say maybe the middle of the pack is right on the that 20 line right there that's where mm-hmm. the split might be um uh, but yeah definitely archer and mjf having the more than half fouls uh than the rest of the roster and getting and a ton of wins and then there's Ortiz all the way over here by, on his lonesome all the way on the right. I think Ortiz is what we would call uh, in the stats biz an outlier. Yeah, a uh, little bit. Seeing that he has, he has what? I can, I can look up the actual number, but he is leading in, uh, in fouls. He has 62 fouls per hour. He fouls in singles matches almost exclusively that's all he does in singles matches but Incredible. he has um uh, he has two he's lost both of his singles matches so for ortiz at the very least maybe you mix it up maybe, maybe it's not working tag team wrestling yeah, maybe stick to tag team wrestling but yeah definitely an outlier when it comes to this a little bit but there you pointed out that a little bit with mjf archer ortiz there's something that you know i guess it's not too much of a surprise but you know, the people that are fouling are your heels. You know, yeah. you got Ortiz, Luther, Jericho, Archer, Santana, Cobb, uh, MJF, um, you know, Guevara. I, I, the only sort of face esque person would be Matt Hardy, but obviously he has multiple personalities. So, you know, like broken Matt Hardy. It should be like, it should be like, Matt Hardy should be in one place. Damascus should be in another place. That's a great point. I <laughs> I might ask. That's gonna be Craig's gonna hate me if I <laughs> ask that to break up the information like that. But yeah, I mean that is a great point because I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know for certain. I would have to like really pay attention. But I wouldn't be mm-hmm. surprised if you know Damascus and Surge and uh, you know uh, normal everyday Matt Hardy version one matt hardy whatever you know what he re- has he wrestles at i imagine their their offensive style is different and at the very least we we you know like you said damascus is a biter you know damascus is 
a guy that isn't afraid to be violent. Damascus is a biter. Damascus is a biter. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it's mainly dominated by heels, which I, is not really too surprising. Um, you know, having on the heels, Matt Hardy being number eight out of 46 wrestlers, you know, the next big face kind of person would probably be Adam Page at number 20. Mm-hmm. Dustin Rhodes at 25. You know, you know, a lot of these, 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 um, a lot of these guys are just simply not fouling. You know, these people like who's someone that has a fairly decent, you know, Joey, Jan- Joey Janela is actually all the way back there. Only six fouls per hour. Joey Janela, a fairly clean wrestler. Where is he on this graph? He's right here, Mikey. Very jo- interesting. Joey Janela, barely any fouls and a negative win loss record in singles action. And then there's Cody and Mox all the way up there. Cody Mox, Mox, Mikey, I'll tell you what. Cody and Moxley, they have been every single graph that I can remember at the very least that we've done of this, Mikey. Cody and Moxley have always been a pair that have been together the entire time. They're always, obviously, you know, they have all these, the butt tons of wins, but they're never like, it's not like Moxley has like 50 fouls, you know? Or, or mm-hmm. Cody has like 50 fouls or Moxley's um, grapples are way higher than Cody. They're always those two are always right next to each other, which is interesting because they're both champions, too, which is a great point, which is something that we're sort of we've sort of dialed in on is that. Mo- it's weird, but, you know, to talk about Cody, which is, you know, many would, people would argue is the ace of the companies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Cody because he's always like very consistent it like cody is a great all-around wrestler he's not like ortiz who's fouling all the time uh he's not like um i don't know brody lee who's got like a lot of strike downs and grapples because he's a hard power lifter heavy hitter kind of guy cody is like he's he's always like basically in the middle of the pack you know, mm-hmm. he's he's an all a great all around wrestler. Moxley, weird to talk about here, because why the hell is Moxley? <laughs> oh, like, wouldn't you think that Moxley has a lot of fouls or Moxley does a lot of uh, uh, things that upset the referee? I guess, but uh, he really doesn't. Like, if you like, I guess if you watch his matches, he really keeps he keeps it pretty clean. Usually, unless it's like a hardcore match. Yeah, I, I guess that's fair. I have to like now. I'm just gonna pay. I really, what this sort of done this show has done for me, Mikey, is like really try to focus on like what the wrestlers are trying to do and stuff. I'm mm-hmm. really going to be focusing on John Moxley moving forward and how he wrestles, because the fact that he doesn't have, like I, you look at the man, you know, unsanctioned violence. You know, what not, is that? What it is? What is it? Unsanctioned Mox violence. Yeah, that's what it is. Like. For a guy that touts himself as unsanctioned violence, he's like middle of the pack, kind of behind the middle of the pack when it comes to fouls. He's he's fairly clean wrestler. I mean, I think that talks to his style, right? It's just that very hard hitting, heavy style, like a lot of high impact moves. That's a good point. These it's that sort of like MMA, New Japan shoot style style yeah. for Moxley. I, mean, I feel like a lot of DDT is a lot of like slams, a lot of strikes you know like very Uh high impact heavy hitting shot like moves are in moxley's arsenal for sure yeah less so less so you know hardcore more so uh hard hit hard hitting Mm -hmm. i was looking at this graph and you got that r squared line you know i sort of mentioned beforehand before we started recording is that that r squared line is sort of indicating how uh accurate something is and by that i mean like if your r squared is one then it basically is saying that's one for one you know you know if this happens then this happens you could 100 for 100 percent certainty say that you know if like if this graph r squared said you know r equals one then you could be like okay 100 percent definitive definitiveness if you foul you can get you will get wins Mm -hmm. right 
here obviously you know it's very very small but i was noticing that that number that 0 0.0257 very very small is almost exactly the same as the last week's graph about taunting La this week was 0 0.0257 last week was 0 0.0238 interesting was that thousands of a point off yeah yeah very kind of wild extreme i i was i was just thinking two about those very like, two very heel traits good point and you got wardlow and archer and mgf and luther and all these guys i in would there. say mgf and archer are right next to each other again very true very true it's also weird saying for me it's very weird saying wardlow out here like i never would have thought wardlow is a big taunter but apparently he is i guess so um but yeah, it's the the numbers here, the the graph at the very least is almost exactly the same. Uh, you know, there's there's the people, the dots of the people are you know spread out a little, a little bit better, but uh, there's less of a cluster in the back here. Mm -hmm. But it's basically the same uh, connect relationship strength, I guess you could yeah. say. Again, Cody and Moxie right next to each other, the two champions just chilling up top. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, what do you think i'm trying to i'm trying to analyze which is a word i've obviously invented just now what what why do you think that do you, is? Mean, do you mean analyze no i mean what i say okay um what why do you think i i have no i'm just trying to think of some sort of theories but do you have any idea why you think the relationship of taunts and fouls are essentially the same. Well, due to my analysis, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I do think like, I, like, like I said before, it's heel traits, you know, like it's very like heels are going to taunt and heels are going to cheat. That's the two things they do a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're con they're full of themselves and they're constantly trying to cheat to win. So I think it's just a heel trait. That, that's connecting them you know i think a lot since since a lot of big heels are taunting and also cheating that the, these graphs are going to be kind of similar that's fair that's fair and and when it comes to that you know your heels aren't always going to be dominating the wins mm -hmm. you know especially when you have cody and moxley you know your outliers over here are getting all these wins and their two faces yeah um or you know you know cutler or trent or qt or all these guys you know they're not getting all these these wins or you know by cheating or taunting or what have you notably scorpio sky and mark quentin not taunters huh not not big taunters i want to see it the last not big taunters. uh on the other graph you got like four people you got who do we got here i'm trying to look at it, look at it real quick you got Kazarian in there. You got Mark Quinn. You got Sonny Kiss. You got Brian Pillman Jr. They're not not Fowlers in no, their they, singles they, matches. They keep it clean as heck. Sonny Kiss is keeping it clean out there. Keeping it pretty clean. I mean, Orange Cassidy has one. <laughs> Orange Cassidy. Coke Cabana has one. Not big Fowlers. They're keeping it clean out there. They're respecting yeah. the referee's rules. And you got to respect that ultimately. Especially if you have a referee like Aubrey Edwards who's going to shove you. <laughs> That's not... Like Jericho. I mean, listen, she, she keeps the order. That's fair. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't... That it, there, that's a good point. That it is connected to... There is something maybe it's less connected to win-loss records or more just connected to heel behavior, which is... I don't know how you track that numbers-wise, but there is at, something to say that the people that are at the top of all these lists are heels. Um maybe it might not be connected to win loss record at all i mean there was a thing we talked about last week i was trying to set it up for this week mikey but there is a whole idea that we talked about with utt rob last week about bay's theorem and basically the whole conversation was basically he was trying to figure out if fouls lead to win loss wins or loss or fouls lead to wins or mm -hmm. wins lead to confidence which lead to um or do uh, wins taunts. lead to fouls that's what I that's what I'm suggesting. I, I I was trying to do the math before we started. I kept screwing it up. Basically, you're like you don't you don't want your number to be above one. And every single time I did the math, I got above one. So I don't know what I was doing. I got to talk to Rob, talk to my teacher Rob. 
But uh, could it be because that when you keep winning, people start getting expectations of you? Then to try to meet those expectations, you cheat to win so you can keep winning so you can meet people's expectations. That's this is a bold theory, which turns them heel because they keep cheating, which makes them taunt more because they're now cocky heels. It just becomes a, this domino effect. It just becomes this domino effect of trying to meet people's expectations. That was a, that was a long that was that was a stretch. I don't know. I don't know. I mean. Wins leading to confidence, which leading to taunt, they make sense. But does wins leading to fouls? Yeah, I it... guess we'll see. I guess we should. I feel like the two numbers, if we're talking about wins, wins possibly leading to fouls. I think the two numbers you should keep an eye on are Cody and Moxley because they're getting they're getting the most wins. So if the ones who are getting the most wins start fouling more, then maybe there's something. You know. I mean, we are we are start teasing Cody as a you know turning heel slightly. Mm-hmm. maybe maybe if we started looking week to week on these numbers and stuff maybe if we just sort of like going on this list maybe there is something to say with uh cody is like fouling more each week or each month or whatever maybe 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 that's something i'm gonna talk to craig that actually that sounds like an interesting <laughs> idea is to look at one wrestler like month to month see what trends change mm-hmm. um but yeah i mean yeah, it's definitely a foul heavy, heel heavy game here. And there's some wins leading to fouls. Yeah, I guess I guess we'll see. I guess we'll. Ulti- I mean, I don't know. Now that I think about it, I, now it, does that make sense? I mean, if you're a, ch- I I don't know. May I don't know. I'm not. I'm now. I was I was gonna say is that if you're champion, why would you foul more? I mean, you're already you're at the pinnacle. You know, you're at Moxley's level. You've reached you've reached the height of winning. Why do you mm-hmm. need to start fouling all of a sudden? And then I immediately thought of the fact that like, oh, you, well, you want to start fouling if it means winning and retaining your title. Yeah. And you, sometimes you get the desperate times call for desperate measures, right? It's like if, the more you want to retain, the more desperate you get to to cheat more. I guess that makes sense. Maybe your expectation theory is plausible at the very least. Maybe. Uh, dang it. Dang it. <sighs> Mike, you can't be right. <laughs> now we need to talk. Now we need to. Now we need to have interviews with wrestlers to see. Hey, do you feel like people's expectations of you are too high? I've I've pitched on the show before that. Hey, uh, I I, told, I, told, I I pitched on the show that we should one hundred percent call up Brandon Cutler, uh, since he's consistent. You know, he's had this huge losing streak. Just call up Brandon Cutler and be like, "Look, Brandon, we got all this data showing what you're doing wrong. You need to change <laughs> it up." You know, maybe you start fouling, you know, and we, we were the we were the secret all along. Yeah, I was like, maybe Cutler, maybe you need I basically what I'm trying to say is I'm extending coaching, you know, assistance for for Brandon Cutler. We got a lot of data suggesting that what he's currently doing in singles competition doesn't work. A lot of, a lot of data, less experience, but a lot of data. Yeah, I guess that's fair. Uh, well then there we go, Mikey. Thank you so much for, for coming on, uh, la- kind of last minute to wrestling of statistics. Um, of course, man. Love, love having you on. Uh, let's get that plug in as well. Since it's technically our show. Uh, I just heard a, uh, a, a, cr- a creak from my door downstairs and it sounded like a witch was breaking in. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, w- tell me what, what can people, where can people find you? What, what do you got to plug? Uh, well, I got to plug our show hit the books, which I did in the beginning already. So go check that out. Uh, go give that a review on iTunes. Give it the, uh, what do, what do we say? Five, six star reviews or six, five star reviews. Yes. Give, give the maximum amount and write and make, and if it doesn't let you put in six stars, put in, uh, in the, in the, in the review section, in the just comments. put an extra star. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let us know. Put an extra star so we have a bunch of five star reviews that say one star. <laughs> <laughs> make sure, make sure you let iTunes know in parentheses like this was so good I had to add an extra star instead of everyone rating it five stars just to rate it one star. I would love if you just did that. Just put one star. <laughs> That's so funny to me. Oh man, uh, it would be incredible. Yeah, go check out Hit the Books every Friday. It's on this this exact podcast feed, so you can go and subscribe to this podcast feed, not only to get more wrestling and statistics every Monday, but you can also get uh, Hit the Books every Friday with both Mikey and me. Uh, and 
if you like both shows, go check out htbpod.com where you can where you can find all of the stuff we do here on the Hit the Books Network, uh, including this show, Wrestling with Statistics, and including Hit the Books and the may, uh, hopefully eventual return of Mikey's Indy 500 uh, with much less problematic wrestlers involved. Uh, but yeah, uh, go check that out. Uh, also want to plug, speaking of websites, want to plug Craig Lease ProWrestlingMusings.com. Go check that out. He's updated with a bunch of articles and whatnot to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, talk about the world of professional wrestling through stats and analytics. I mean, that's the whole game. This is just the podcast form of that. So go check that as well. Uh, he's got great articles up there. Uh, what else? Uh, like, you know, like we said, leave a review for this show as well. Uh, you you know, you can go check out if you want to see next week, go to our YouTube channel, hit the books podcast to get, uh, that sort of, uh, video visual aspect to the show as well. Um, and I think that's it that I can think of off the top of my head. So yeah. Oh, and, uh, yeah, go follow us at hit the books pod on Twitter. Uh, you can follow Craig if you like at Craig PW musings on Twitter. Uh, that is officially it. Now they have it all written down and, and memorized now. Uh, so thank you again, Mikey, so much for coming on to wrestling of statistics. Love having you, uh, hope to see you around, uh, in a couple hours when we record hit the books. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> can't wait see you see you a little later uh have until then have a great time everybody we'll be back next monday for all new episode of wrestling of statistics until then have a great one goodbye